Oh, I forgot. So this is the 97th iteration of a Friday episode, which is kind of batshit crazy to me, actually. <laughs> but I'm actually slightly proud of myself because I haven't missed one yet. So almost two years of consistent yeah. Q&A. But before I started today, I had been getting a lot of questions about jujitsu and the camps that I go to. So I was going to do an ad read, okay. which is not really an ad read. But so for people who've been asking... I'm not one to give investment advice because I like to buy high and sell low and new cars and all that stuff that doesn't pay off well. But I think that investing in yourself is probably the best investment you can make. And uh, you came and watched a little jujitsu yesterday. I love it. I do it as much as I can. And I have found that going to camps and seminars, it actually, it kind of helps accelerate your progression. And the ones that I've been really enjoying are the Henry Aikens camp. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, the, the coach I've been telling you we've kind of been following around and he has specifically hidden jujitsu camp. So hidden normal spelling jujitsu. And for people curious, it's J I U jitsu camps.com. And he has two camps up. One's in Destin, Florida, and one is in Las Vegas. I'm going to be at both. Yeah. You're going to, maybe you'll have sh- sticker shock when you look at it, but all I can say is I've been to every one that he's offered for the last two years. And I don't see why I would ever stop and register for both. It's the single best investment that I've made in myself and in my jujitsu since I have started. The camps are unbelievable, so don't mess around. There's limited spots. HiddenJujitsuCamps.com. And, uh, yeah, that's all I got. You ready for Q&A? Let's go. All right. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. I have 12 questions, uh, and these span the gambit. So, fortunately, we're not incredibly limited on time. I'll get you to the airport after this. But I'm just going to – I think I reshuffled them a little bit. So, if any of them are repetitive in nature or theme, people will have to uh, just deal with it. You ready? Yeah. All right. Question one. This is based off the picture that I took of you when you were sitting right over there. And this person said, I see an assortment of books scattered there because you were looking at all those books. What's on your dad's reading list? Who are his favorite authors, characters, and villains or books he recommends people read at least once? Because this is a new one. Nobody's ever asked us this one. Wow. I'm pretty much a history buff. Uh I, I I start a lot of books. I don't finish an awful lot of them. Uh, what causes you to stop reading them? They bore me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I you know the, the picture the picture looks good or the 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 jacket's great. Uh, fiction or non? Do, uh, you, do you go more both? More fic, more nonfiction. I I like nonfiction. I like good fiction. I'm reading a book now. I forget the gentleman's uh, the author. It's about some very remote part of Russia. He's a historian, and it, it's been a great glimpse into what's happening in Russia with their past, their troubles, how Im- people can't imagine how immense uh, Russia is. Yeah. And they have this fa- far, far out uh, area where the uh, Siberian tigers have lived, and they're being hunted and exported and what have you. And it... He talks, he has the action parts of it, and then he goes into the history and the brutality of Lenin and Stalin. And, I mean, it's people... You wonder why the Ukraine is hanging on like they are. These are nasty people. Because they're hard people. They are hard people. Environmentally, it's, it's, it's a harsh land. They've been fighting a long time, and they're just hard people. But uh, I, I like historical books. I like... Uh, Oh gosh, some of my fiction. I God, if you hadn't asked me, I could have told you. <laughs> uh, Any uh, nonfiction books that you think would be a must-read for people? I mean, you were an educator for a long period of time. Anything mm-hmm. that you would? Well, actually, along that vein, what do you think of banning books and reading lists of books that should should not be, or people are saying should not be used in school? I'm against it. You know, I just I think parents should have the right to determine what their kids are exposed to, and I think there are age appropriate. And when those lines are crossed, I think then you come in. But to just get rid of them, I'm 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 opposed to that. 
Uh, I mean, Hemingway was a great writer, just fascinating character. People will like that because there were many suggestions that you go to Florida and enter a Hemingway lookalike contest. I've won three of them. You haven't. <laughs> you have not. Uh, People wonder where I get my sarcasm from. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> Falk. Falk was another great uh, 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 author. Oh, gosh, I can't remember them now. I haven't read them in a long time, but like the books of Exodus and uh, uh, Alaska and Texas, these stories they create with people, but then are intermersed with really what happened, the, the migration that got people there, how they dealt with the indigenous people that were there, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, I'm fascinated by that because, as I've always said, as much as the world changes it doesn't change an awful lot it's just got there's bigger toys there's bigger weapons and it infects so many uh more people uh i'll think of more as we go and i'll i'll throw them in there all right question two during your time in australia what was your favorite place to visit and did you ever see one of their uh snakes the long list of their poisonous snakes no, uh, never got involved. I, I can't stand snakes or bugs very much. <laughs> <laughs> they just scare the bat shit out of me. So that's your weak link, huh? Yeah. That's, but I'm not a huge fan of snakes either. Australia was a fascinating country. We were there in the early 70s, and we took a trip. Uh, it was a six-week trip. We drove. Mom was six months pregnant with Casey, and we drove with another couple from... Uh, Melbourne to Perth. It was like driving from San Francisco to New York, to New York. but there were one lane roads, and a, a big part of it was unpaved, called the Nullabar Plain. I went there because my father had been, your grandpa had been stationed in Perth uh, during World War II, and it's such a they're fascinating communities. Uh, whether uh, you go up, people don't. A lot of people don't realize there was a, a gold rush that followed the gold rush in. California, and so many of those miners went from there to Australia, and we visited those areas. The snowy mountains were beautiful. They were uh, the very northeastern part of uh, Victoria. Uh, anywhere that the British have come, they've infested the waters with trout, and I'm a trout fisherman. In fact, <laughs> you're, <laughs> I, I mean, your sister had her first Christmas I caught three brown trout, and she was in a backpack on my back, and I got so excited, I bent over to pick them up, and she almost fell out. But Sounds about right. Yeah, but there's there's so many different places that are different, whether it's Perth, uh, Melbourne, which is a city that's very similar to San Francisco. Which is where Casey was born, right? No, she was born in a little community called Shepparton. Near Melbourne? Uh, it was halfway between... The uh, Victorian New South Wales border and uh, uh, Melbourne. Shows you what the hell I know. Yeah. I think I've told people for years she was born in Melbourne. Yeah, and South Australia, there was uh, 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 vineyards and a, a growing uh, uh, wine industry. You go to Queensland, which is the tropics. You go to Darwin, which is out in the middle of God knows nowhere. But they're all fascinating communities. Most of the population of uh, Australia lives right along the, the ocean. You start going inland, and there isn't much. Uh, it was fascinating. I, I hope to, before I die, go back to her one more time. I'd like to take Casey and the whole family there and show her where she was, you know, what was going on. It'd be a cool trip. I'd yeah. be down for that. Yeah. Okay. I believe what they're trying to say is I'm in my early 50s. Parents divorce when I was nine. Think Sean Buck Rogers. So I'll give you a little bit of feedback on this one or uh, context. So he's been on twice. He was a Army Green Beret. His uh, his upbringing was, at least in my experience and listening to it, one of the roughest upbringings like possible. We're talking addiction. I would describe it as abuse. I mean, other people could use whatever term they would want to, but stories of, you know, running through the desert to get to extended family members, houses, barefoot, stuff like that in the middle of the night. So for context, that's what this person's referencing. So they're in their 50s, early 50s. Parents divorced when he was nine. Think Sean Buck Rogers' book for my childhood. 
I can't forgive my parents. My mom passed two years ago from brain cancer, and even on her last day, I couldn't forgive her. I haven't spoken to my dad in two years. How do you forgive? How do you let go of the past and move forward? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes the pain, <clears throat> and you see, as you, especially as you get older, how it affects you. You know, it's sometimes you got baggage you just can't get rid of. But I don't think you ever stop that effort of trying to forgive. Just that exercise itself is cleansing. Uh, yeah, I've had friends, not anything near that. But I think the effort of of concentrating and it's it's. Yeah, I, 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 as you well know, I had some real struggles with my mom and dad, particularly my dad. That's actually a question that I selected intentionally. It'll come up later. Yeah, but it, I have finally got to the point that I have forgiven him. And all of a sudden it just happened. And I think it's because I left my heart open to it. I fought it for so long that I realized that effort was doing more harm than good. Did you find it? Did you fight it because you wanted something from him like you wanted him to say something or was it an internal struggle in yourself i wanted him to hurt and that was evil and i realized it and once i took the time to back up i had to look beyond the experiences that him and i had and i had the opportunity because i had his brother to talk to about where he came from mm -hmm. it gave me clarity to what it produced and uh, I just, just somehow I was able to. Uh, I didn't deal with it always appropriately. It cost me my mother who was, she was involved in it, but she wasn't an active participant. In it. I watched her with her to the point that she died of, they said it was dementia. I think it was a broken heart more than anything else. But yeah, I think you just don't quit trying to give, uh, give someone forgiveness. I know there's things that happen to people that you can't even speak of that happen in the human chain of life that are unforgivable. But the greatest majority of the times, just the effort of trying to make that personal change in your life is worth the effort. I struggle sometimes with forgiveness because I feel, and this is not correct, I'm going to say, preface, that there is a step in between being angry and forgiveness, and that step is revenge. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a sweet taste too sometimes. Not really. In <laughs> well, the end, it actually makes everything worse, but yeah, exactly. it's like my natural desire is, oh, yeah? Like, I, I, of course I should put the effort into just forgiving, but I, if I'm being totally honest, I get stuck on the thought that per perhaps a slice of revenge would be a nice dessert. I think that's part of our human nature. <laughs> At least it is for a lot of us. You know, it's we get so caught up in things that we can't control. Yeah. And other people's emotions are one of them. And when we let their emotions start to control our outcomes and our behavior, they've won. You know, and it's not always about winning or losing because almost everybody loses in those situations. But I have found especially as I'm getting older and uh, it's, it's just friggin' wasted energy. And I am at a point in my life now I look back and it seems like it was a blink of the eye and it's over. And uh, you look, I look at so much of the, 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 the things that have bothered me. I, I write a lot. I write to myself. It's a form of my own self healing. And I go back and I read them four or five years later, and it's just shocking some of the things that you carry that just unloading that, it gives you, it opens your heart and gives you room, room to breathe. And uh, if, it's not always easy. You know, it's painful. It's anything but easy in my experience. And a lot of times, through a lot of it, you got to look at yourself. And I've said this to you before. That's what, you know, it's looking at yourself is a painful thing and then figuring out maybe I should listen, you know, because there's, we don't want to pass those things on to our children. You know, it's, it's inevitable. There's a certain part of us, chemistry or whatever that we pass on. I see it in my grandchildren. You know, I see it in you and Casey. 
it's I see it in different family members. But I think it's just that constant desire to want to be better, whether it's professionally, uh, you know, with your spouse, your children, and a lot of times just with yourself, you know. It's as I started coaching a women's team, and I'd coached men for so long, which is it's completely different worlds. And I was speaking with you the other day about how that experience with them has made me a better person. I won't say it's made me softer, but I'm a lot more reflective. And, uh, you know, I, I owe them a big debt for that. There is a question that comes up later. It was specifically about your experience with your dad. And I'm curious. Uh, I'll let the question speak for itself, but there is another one that comes up. We can talk about it at whatever depth you want to. Yeah, but this one's tough. Forgiveness is – it is tough. But if you can get past that point, in my experience, it does give you room to breathe. And a lot of times I have noticed in my experience, the person that you're harboring, whatever feeling you would apply to it, uh, resentment, contempt, they don't realize it. So you're investing all of this energy in something that is very one-way conversation. And not every time, but almost every time that I've actually sat down and had the hard conversation, they're nothing but apologetic because it was a lack, a large part of lack of realization on their part as well. So it's just this output of energy and thought process. Yeah. It's not about them. It's about you. You know, it's about what it does for you. Well, that doesn't work because that's much more difficult. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it is what it is. All right. How would how would he, meaning you, keep a high school senior boy on track after high school? Get a baseball bat. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, in 2022, that's not the correct answer. That's true, you know. And but, what do you mean by on track? Your track or his track? And there's, it's, there's, there's a, there's a meeting ground there. I mean, you're cautious. You're, you, you know, you're looking out for all the soft spots, the hard spots. But they got to go out there and find it. I mean, give them a place they can always come back to. Someone that has you, they know that they have your ear, you know. And if, if phasing things to young people, you don't have to be right to the point. You work around the edges and just always give them room to grow. Even when you're harnessing that, sometimes, you know, it's like a racehorse. Sometimes you got to put in a different bridle to, you know, hey, when I pull back on this, I want your attention. Sometimes you just want to ease into it. Ah, you know... That's such a wonderful age group from high school to reaching young adulthood. And having a safe place to explore is its such a wonderful gift you give your kids. You know, it's like when you were growing up, I mean, I'm going, oh, shit. This is, I know what you're getting into, <laughs> but, you know, you had such a passion for it. Are and you talking so, about my choice to join the military? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, as a parent, you got to say, you know, maybe this child's just not quite ready for that. So you create an alternative place where you can divert them a little bit until they get the skills that they need. Because it's an, it's an unforgiving place out there. It is, and they're in an age where they can make really stupid decisions that will potentially impact them for the rest of their life. Yeah, I mean, and it's making sure that the work that you have to do is so important before they go out there. You know, just the basics of life, you know, it's you cover all of those things, but just being open and allowing them have an ear that they can hear and you develop that with respect. And they, they that respect it gets developed by taking the time to listen to them. Don't always let it be auditory back at them, but just sometimes just listen. Yeah, it's better to work like a radio, transmit and receive. You got two ears and one mouth, you know, and that's an analogy that is very simple, but it, it can be very, very accurate. Sometimes you got to listen twice as much as you talk. So I, generally, I think good advice for just about everything in life. Yeah. What is the most rewarding thing that happened to you in your life so far that you didn't expect? Oh, God, what an interesting question. <laughs> 
Some wow. of these I feel like I should give you like the night before, but oh, I also my. think it would change your answers. Gee whiz. The most rewarding thing. Probably the love I get back from my kids and my grandkids. I can be a prickly old bastard, you know, and, and I and I'm pretty stubborn. Say it isn't so. <laughs> I've never noticed that. <laughs> but I think it it's it's the 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 your relationships, you know, I've I've had two wonderful wives. What they've given me, but even more so than that, is having the privilege of watching my family and children grow. Those are experiences that, you know, uh there's just, I mean, sometimes it's just a hug. Sometimes it's a look. You know, sometimes it's an, an accomplishment. I mean, it's, 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 you can't put a hat on it. As soon as you put a hat on it, you've put a shadow over it and it stops growing. You know, it doesn't mean you always agree every direction they go or what have you. That doesn't matter. But the most precious thing has got to be my family and watching it grow. And having that opportunity for as long as I've had. I often think of your mom often about how much she'd be enjoying this, watching all of it. I mean, it's it's because uh, every time I get in a jam, I always ask, how, what would mom do? And 90 percent of the time I do what that answer is. So I've been very blessed in many, many things. Good answer. OK. What was your parenting model to raise a boy? Who became a seal. I'm sure you never envisioned that ever happening, but it did. I'm not saying that I want my boys to be borderline insane, but to achieve such a goal is saying I did my job as a dad. You've got a good son there, and I would hope I raise mine to the same level of success. Well, I was raised in a family business. So I was exposed at a very early age, as I did with you, to what the man's world was all about on, on work sites. As you've said, there's, you've seen just about every appropriate, inappropriate male behavior before you ever went into the oh, teams. Oh, both. both. Yeah. So well, let's be very honest. <laughs> I have memories of being on your shoulders in a bar with the Missoula maggots well under the age of 10. Yeah. The inappropriate behavior slash appropriate, depending on your lens, uh, the exposure to that began long before I started working for you at the age of 11. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say, you know... <laughs> I've, I've caught on that. Full disclosure, <laughs> mom was at the bar too. So yeah. it's not like it was you galvanting off on the weekend. Well, no. You know, I always did it with mom's blessing. I mean, she... She was there most of the time. Oh, she was there most of the time. I think it's letting children see the humor in life. We take life so seriously. I mean, there's... And they saw us. It, and you grew up in a family business, seeing the hours we worked, the dedication it took, the support between husband and wife. We were we were not only we were business partners as well, and we played hard together. Uh, always trying not to, you know, take advantage of anybody, but just be real honest about what's out there and what it is to to be a man. Uh, you, you you gather that respect in difficult situations, situations you're not even ready for. Uh, yeah, you know, people so often take life so gosh darn seriously. And that's not meaning that it's not serious. But humor has got me through life and still continues to. And uh, in that humor, questions that would never be asked from your children will be asked you and it's such a great platform to explore real delicate conversations you know whether it's catching your son out behind the dugout with the boys having a beer you know uh you know you could be you could you could handle that really wrong or you can it can open up a world that you've got avenues that they come back to you for advice you want to create avenues that they'll come back to you to ask other questions. You shut that off with harshness. Uh, you've lost. You've lost. All, you've lost 
to me almost everything. You know, it doesn't mean we always agree. A lot of times you just have to agree to disagree, and that's so healthy. It's just, you know, it's one I've watched parents of. And the other thing is, is being too liberal. I had friends watching them. You know, they wanted to be their child's best friend. And now these kids today have no parameters. And they're, yeah. you know, it, it, it's a fine line that you walk. Again, I've always said I think it's honesty. Let your kids see you be a jerk. You know, I don't mean a not that bad or what have you, but let them see you having fun. Let them see in you, you know, have your guard down. You know, those are all learning moments for them. It's then something they've seen instead of all of a sudden I'm so the lines are so drawn that there is none of that gray area. Well, when they get start reaching out and they get into those gray areas, they won't have any reference points. Yeah, I was going to say, looking at this question and listening to you answer it from the other side, uh, you know, from the person that was being raised. And I'm trying to think, you know, the it's hard to say the exact strategy or lesson that would have lended me or helped me be successful in becoming a seal so looking back what i can say though is i think the uh the willingness and desire to expose me to challenging and difficult things like the job site i mean i've talked about it many times my job i'd show up like awesome six (laughs) pallets of brick that i get to move or all i was doing was filling up buckets with mud and you know moving up the scaffolding that that sucks but there was never you and mom always gave me plenty of rope, but I was never like off. By, you know what I mean? Like I had boundaries, but there was no attempt to nerf the world or make every corner rounded or protected. And I think that probably more than anything and allowing me and actually not, I mean, <clears throat> let's be very clear. When I was 11, I didn't have a choice as to whether or not I was going to be working for you. <laughs> but in doing so in exposing me to challenging and difficult things, it had tremendous impact for me throughout the course of my life. And I think not doing that for your kids, not that there's a pure recipe for either, but you pair that with the the parents who want to be friends with their kids as opposed to being a parent, or they want to remove all challenge and hardship from their formative years of mm-hmm. their children's development. Yeah. I, I can't give this person a recipe for success, but I would say I think those two things would be a recipe for likely them being less successful. I really do think that just the environment that I was exposed to was, you know, I look back at my military career, I I can frame things through the lens of being a SEAL and the leadership lessons and all that stuff, but, or hard work or chunking big goals into small goals, but that's what I was doing with a tongue of bricks. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to have a shitty day? Yeah. Look at, oh, I have, I just moved six bricks, 494 to go, (laughs) 488 more to go. Like, it's terrible. And and I learned naturally, like, okay, I'm just going to focus on this rat. And so I can view it through the lens, but I learned those lessons early. They just were refined, but that wouldn't have happened had I not been exposed to it. Well, I think a lot, especially when you, the obvious situation we're looking at is the teams, it takes a unique individual to do that. And it was real obvious to both your mom and I that you were that person. You were driven. You were disciplined. I mean... I, I never had any real doubts that you would be successful because just your personality and who you were, you know, I'm not saying you were born to be a SEAL, but there were characteristics there that that enabled you to be successful and still do today in your business adventures and your, I watch you work out in your jujitsu, you know, and and uh, it's and how hard you work that has always been a part of your characteristics as it is your sisters but that was also taught and refined though exactly yeah you know there's there's a lot of lot of a lot of cards in the deck yeah you know and uh yeah, there's you know stop looking for the trump card just try to find a hand that you can work with and then you just push it as hard as you can and i mean that's what you've done i mean you know it's I didn't. A, I didn't get to. Not that I think I'm anywhere in life, but I have not gotten to where I am, and you haven't gotten to where you are by avoiding difficult things. Mm-hmm. So I can't give you necessarily, like I said, a step by step approach to this person writing this question. But what I can tell you is the successes that I have had were through the willingness to 
go headlong at challenging things? I think challenges are important. I talk to my rugby team about it. It's don't avoid the challenges. Embrace them. Look for them. You know, and even if you, whatever metric you want to use that you might have failed, you haven't failed. You know, it's like I tell my rugby team, I don't care about the scoreboard. I said, there's things I look for. And sometimes, you know, we have lost a game and I tell them, I said, we didn't lose. We just ran out, ran out of time. You know, give us a little longer and we'd have won that. It's just, it's, it's don't avoid challenges. Look for them, whatever they are, academically, physically, sports, management, all kinds of stuff. It's just take yourself out of the comfort zone. You know where it's at, you know, and it's a, it's a place to go to, but Find comfort in challenge too. You know, get you get used to it. Well, you, then you start looking for it. Yeah, exactly. You know, because okay, I can go here and I'll get this, but if I push myself, you know, it's it's those are lessons that are invaluable, and they will be they will lead to your success in whatever you do. Yeah, couldn't agree more. All right, so this is the question about, and I've talked briefly about the relationship you had with your dad. I haven't mm-hmm. unpacked it much because I think it's your story to tell and. Talk about this at whatever level you want. But the question, Andy has shared that you cut off contact with a family member many years ago. I'm not sure how much you wish to share to what led you to that decision. But I wonder, with time and wisdom, do you feel it was the right decision? Andy, how do you feel about it? Was it hard for you? It seems most families have some version of this. And you may offer some good advice to someone struggling with when or how to cut ties. And I would agree with that last part. I think if you dig into any family deep enough, you're going to find interpersonal conflict because human beings are an absolute sloppy mess. But do you feel it was the right decision? I mean, you talk about the situation. Do you feel it was the right decision? And with some more time and wisdom under your belt, have your thoughts changed about it? At the, at the time, it was the right decision. Do you want to explain what happened? Well, yeah. I, you know, I was... Uh, like I said, I was raising a family business. I was an only child. I was a big kid, so I went to work like you did. I put you went to work. Uh, I had a great, loving father. <laughs> he was a hard-headed German. I look back now, and he was the classic example of post-traumatic stress, his experiences in the war. And uh, He did not drink, though, correct? Yeah, he was an alcoholic, but he was a dry alcoholic. Okay. He was uh, he was about 5 foot 10. Had a 52-inch chest. He was a monster. And uh, he quit drinking when he was about 23 years old. But he never lost the behavioralism of an alcoholic. Hmm. So, you know, he was great with me. He gave me a lot of opportunities. I mean, as a kid, I not only had to work in the workplace, but I'd go on hunting trips where I started coming to Montana in 1961 as a kid. Uh, and, and the business grew. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, the real estate real estate markets in our hometown went bananas, and all of a sudden, he became a very, very wealthy man. And uh, was he still partnered with his brother at that time? No, the family the family was torn apart between the relationship by my my father and his brother. My dad was a control freak, and the business was expanding. His brother wanted more responsibilities, more that were just his. So, he, And my dad had an emotional breakdown. It broke the family. I mean, my my uncle, us, and my grandparents lived less than a quarter of a mile apart. And for years, nobody talked. I, I mean, I was in a relationship with my, my grandparents, but my poor uncle, he was, it was cut off. And my father became a born-again evangelical Christian, which I have no qualms about. I mean, that's... What led to that? Well, we were a religious family. I mean, I went to church. It was... That was... My father was... We had no people come to our house. He was a very... Uh, I look back on it now, and he was... He was he was very insecure. You know, little man syndrome. And... Uh, but the church was his rock. and We went to it. I... Never could figure it out. It didn't make sense to me, but they were great people. They were loving people. You know, they were a great support system. And then when he got the money made him this unapproachable person. And I was, this was the 60s, the 70s. 
a lot of change going on, not only with the the world, but relationships and how we dealt with it. And uh, your mom and I, uh, we made all our decisions together. And uh, him, it was my mother lived in almost servitude to him. And uh, it became it was it being an issue between me and him and how I lived my married life and how I was raising my children. And uh, I restarted my business in Santa Cruz. I reached out to him for some help. He gave it, but it all started coming with contingencies. And uh, it got to the point that my father just, your mom and I realized it was not the behavior we wanted our children to see. It wasn't a legacy we wanted to pass pass on. I gave my parents the opportunity, in particular my mom, and my dad went absolute batshit crazy, literally crazy. I tried to get him into counseling groups. Uh, I said, let's go meet with your pastor. We need someone that can mediate this. And uh, he was an ex-Green Beret. The man was a clinical criminal psychologist. He had two PhDs in, in psychology. He left the uh, clinical world to become uh, a, person, a person of faith. He had a, a, his, his church. So I said, let's go meet with him. And it got to the point that it didn't work. And he took me aside one day and he says, look, your dad's got at least three personalities that I know of. And he's dangerous. And that's when I talked to my father in the parking lot and made it really clear to him. Well, you saw it. We were up at their house. I didn't see any chats in the parking lot. No, that- no, that's before. I, that was before. And, yeah, uh, you know, we were about six, seven months. And he was sending you guys registered letters, the yeah. letters to me saying just who he thought I was, which there were no, it was all pretty nasty stuff. Well, what would you say to him in the parking lot? I told him if he shook his cane at me one more time, I was going to cram it right down his throat. And I don't think any man had ever said that to him. My uncle shared that to me because my dad went immediately from his house, from the church to his house and was, I mean, you just didn't talk that way. I actually, I told him I was going to put it in a different orifice, but yeah. Yeah. So, and, uh, I'm going, oh shit! What have I got into here? But uh, I do remember it was around Christmas time. I remember we went to their house. I don't remember how the conversation escalated, but I do remember it was like Christmas Eve. After it was after Christmas, it was February. Was it really? Yeah, because he wanted us to come over at Christmas time, and I said no. By then, I started dealing with my dad. I said we're going to do things on my terms. That's a conversation I have with myself. So there was at least some attempted <clears throat> re- reconciliation between So you guys. we go up to his house, you and Casey, mom and I, and he didn't want that. He just wanted me to come up. And I said, no, this is a family thing. You guys were sitting around grandma, mm-hmm. and uh, it was obvious it was going nowhere. So I said, you know, do you mind leaving the room? We'll, we want to talk to grandma. And she said yes, and he fl- he started calling the cops. And that's what I remember, really. I don't remember any of the content of the conversation. I remember sitting on their couch, looking like up at the ceiling, going, you guys got really weird lights. Mm-hmm. Because it was the rotary lights remember on top the of the- barking dog? <laughs> yeah. Every time you get noise going, the barking dog would go on. Yeah. So the sheriffs show up. And they got their hands on their pistols. They come in and, you know, we're sitting around grandma talking. And it, and it, then he go, what the fuck is happening here? So- they said, look, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. It's the last time I saw my mom. Same here. Yeah, exactly. Last time I saw him, too. Yeah. I take that back. That's, Other than today, that motherfucker showed up at my bud's graduation. Bud's, yeah. Uninvited. Casey was fucking livid. She yeah. was, oh, man. But anyway, so we're going out the door. I get you guys out the door, and I stop at the door. My dad was behind the door, and I asked the police officer. I said, can I take a second to say something to my dad? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cops were like, oh, and boy. He, and he said, well, he saw that. You know, he says, yeah, what the hell? And I said, he said, well, be careful. So I stepped back around the door, and I just looked him right in the eye. And I said, I hear. You lay a hand on my mother, I'll kill you. And that was the last conversation I had with him. So to the question, with time and wisdom, 
Do you feel it was the right decision? What, what would you have changed? Because I know he, he passed, was it about a, no, it was more than a decade after that. Mm -hmm. The thing I would have changed is I would have, I would have got my mom out of that situation forcibly, but I tried to. What do you think would have happened if you had tried to, for well, I mean, by forcibly? I, did. I had finally got her, What their oldest and dearest friends, a man who I respected dearly, who wouldn't say crap if he had a mouthful, gets a hold of me and he says, you've got to get your mom to an attorney. I mean, we're talking lots of money here. Yeah. And I didn't care about the value of it. It's just how he would, he says she, he's getting hurt under duress to change the wills and everything. I mean, I I, I received no inheritance at all, yeah. you know, which <laughs> I never looked back. It didn't matter. But so we get my mom to an attorney, and I'm, bless her soul. I mean, she was so embarrassed. He was so controlling. He would buy all her clothes, including her underwear. This guy was just, he was warped. And we had a restraining order put on him. And it was to be issued the next day. That night, she called me and said, I can't go through with it. And I just said, Mom, I respect you've got the right to do whatever you want. I might not agree with your decisions, but it's yours to make. And that was the last time I ever talked. That there still to this day kills me. Yeah. You know, because I was, I was everything that that lovely woman lived for. I mean, the, she was... And at one time, both my parents were wonderful, wonderful people. You know, I, I don't know whether my father's <coughs> post-traumatic stress got to him or I don't know. He, he, he just, I'd make that decision again in a heartbeat because both your mom and I said, we do not want our children to see this and think that this is appropriate behavior. And we didn't know any other way other than separating it. And we still live in the same town. I, when my dad died, I, I found out through an attorney, you know, same with my mom. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, it was so severe. My uncle Donnie, who literally became my dad. And the traumatic thing was him is how he forced his parents to make a choice between him and his brother. And they chose him because he threatened them. They and, chose Donnie's brother, your dad. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And it, to the day he died, Donnie and I would talk about it. He was in the hospital dying. Uh, Debbie and I were going to Utah. We had our tickets and everything bought. And Chip says, you got to go. It's okay. So the night, the, the morning before we left, the mo night before we left, I went back to the hospital. I knew, knew, I knew nobody would be there. So I go in and, and we're sitting there talking. He's holding on to my hand. And uh, he brought it up again. I mean, it was so... To his last day. To his last day, you know, what could we have done different? You know, da-da-da-da-da-da, yeah, you know, and I gave him a big kiss before I left. I knew it was, I'd never see him again. Yeah, it just, it was, you talk about families, you know. <sighs> Jesus, I don't know. It's just... <laughs> Well, to answer the question, you know, because they added on here, how do I feel about it? My recollection of it is vague at best. Like I said, I remember, obviously, I remember the time of year. I thought it was right at like Christmas or Christmas Eve. I remember the lights. Mm -hmm. But for me, what I remembered more and why I didn't have an issue with it is I saw the impact that it was having on you, mm -hmm. the relationship between you and your dad and you and your mom and the, the lopsided triangle, if you would want to call it that, of those three. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't want – and I didn't have an issue really not having contact with him because, again, I was very – I had, what was I, maybe eight, nine? No, you were in high school. Was I? <laughs> and we were living on Trevorton. So, oh, shit. That was older than I thought. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, again, it was still, though, younger in my life, and I was more concerned in the impact that it was having on you as opposed to the relationship that I – had with them. It was tough to lose, you know, our grandmother, mm -hmm. but I understood why. And I saw that it was better for you to not have that relationship than to try to navigate your way through that. I struggled with that for years. My cousin, Chip, yeah, Donnie's son. Yeah. We still talk about it, you know, and what could have been. It was such an, a strong family business, but it just, uh, you know, jealousy, control, 
I mean, it's just, uh, it's just, the human spirit is such a del- delicate thing. And it was so confusing for me to be raised by this man who I adored, I respected, worked with him, and I learned how to work. I learned how to take on obstacles, uh, you know. And then all of a sudden, he just turns into this this beast. And I saw him abusing other people as well, you know, because he, the, I mean, one day I'm at, a, at an intersection, a car pulls in front of me, goes by, and it's a Rolls Royce, and it's somebody's inside giving me the finger. <laughs> and I fucking figured out it was my dad. <laughs> you know, I'm going, this doesn't get any better. You know, huh? you could write this shit up in a script and people, you know. I mean, if I had to look, I, again, humor. I just, I looked at this and I'm going, you little bastard, you know? And, but at the same time, I realized I missed, I missed so much of that. I mean, as a young kid from the time I'm 12, 13, my first hunting rifle was a lever action 30, 30 to a 270 Winchester, seven millimeter Magnums all the way up. And it was the only vacations my family ever took. And the women didn't go or the guys would, you know, We'd be gone for 10 days, two weeks, and I always look so much forward to that because, ah, uh, yeah, it's I, I still have dreams about it, you know. So what advice would you give to someone struggling with when or how to cut ties? Because I do, like I said at the beginning of this question, I do think that this is a much more common thing yeah. in families. And if it's not, if you're not experiencing it now, I think that's awesome. But I bet if you dig around a little bit in the family history and lineage, you'll find it somewhere. I think you have to prioritize what's important. And at that time, it wasn't my father that was important. It was my family. And they were learning. Fuck, I was learning. I never, you know, how do you learn to deal with that? You know, I had friends, dear friends I still have, that were telling me, going through that, your dad's not. I could not accept that. Yeah. You know, I knew he was hard. You know, you know, but I just, and, you know, I mean, his nickname was the Grizz. He was a grizzly bear. I mean, and, but that was the world I grew up in. Uh, the part of Santa Cruz we lived in was Live Oak, which was a small community. It was just all chicken ranches. The reason we lived out there, land was cheap. And, uh, I mean, we built all the original buildings at Cabrillo College, went from a little with a wheelbarrow and a, and a truck to this massive, uh, very successful business. And it was tore apart because of control and jealousy. And it, it affected so many people. Yeah, you know, it just, uh, in some ways it made me a better person. Uh, it, it hurts you, it cripples you. But again, that's another challenge of life. Yeah. How do you make it better? How do you live with it? Yeah. All right, shifting gears. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How do you run your rugby practice? And what's your pros and cons of running one three three one? First off, what the hell is one three three one? Who the hell knew about that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, one three three one is there's seven forwards. Excuse me, there's eight forwards and seven backs. The forwards are like the linemen in football. The uh, eight. The seven backs are like the quarterback, wide receivers, running backs. So the one three three one is I put one forward on one wide side of the field, one forward on the other side of the field, and then I put two three-person pods in the center of the field. Okay. A rugby field is a big field. I put the two, I call them the wings, the one ones, 20 meters off the, the plane line. So that shrinks the area that my big gals have to cover, and it makes you more effective. And that way also when we're attacking, I've got that extra forward there that we're putting a big gal on two little gals. You know, I'm just always trying to put us in an advantageous position. What would be the potential cons of that uh, one three three one? I haven't found one yet. There you go. You know, I, I <laughs> th- well, there's different forms of it. There, there's a two four two. There's all kinds of, but I like the pod system where I always have three 
people, and we attack from it. I mean, we're vicious the way we attack. We'll run two, two three-person pods at backs, and it forces the defense to make an adjustment. And then I have trained the backs to learn what that adjustment is because there's always a weak point somewhere. I mean, we're not always successful. It breaks down. Somebody drops the damn ball or one damn thing. But I had such a young team. One of the biggest parts of struggling with coaching women's rugby is the most successful teams in the world are the teams that can re-engage. Go into a tackle, get knocked down, and immediately get up and get involved again. It took me four years to figure out a plan, and the one three three one was that because the two three person pods, they have to be active, and I've got them in incredible shape. We and it's, it's the game of rugby is all about support, support like anything that's successful, support, support, support. And how do I run my practice? I break it up into three groups. We have individual skills, whether it's ball handling skills, tackling. Uh, Decision making, running three on twos, two on ones. Then there's a middle practice where we break up into forwards and backs, where they each have individual skills. <clears throat> and then we come together and we run a team run where we put it all together. And sometimes I spend more time in the day. We practice on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays when we're not playing on Saturdays. <clears throat> Monday is a, a run day. We play touch rugby. It's all about fast work in the the bumps and the bruises out. Tuesday's contact day. We flat peel it back and just start knocking the dog shit out of each other. And on uh, Wednesday is Monday, Tuesday. No, and Thursday. On Thursday is uh, th the day we uh, run a lot, just running everybody together. We'll still do the, still do the little breakups, but we spend more t time on on recognition. You know, transitioning from an attack to a defending position. Uh, I break I break the field up into four quadrants, so everybody knows where we're going. You got the you got the left quadrant, which is is one. You got from that quadrant to center is two. Next quadrant is from center to three, and then four. And whoever our backs are, you got your backs number two, three, four, five. I just go 12, and we're, we're running to that quadrant with the two ball. Or I go 35, we're running the first five back into the three quadrant. And we can do it when we kick off. We signal to each other where we're going to put the ball, or at least attempt to. And so it's just about, it's like anything, it's communication. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been intriguing. Uh, the, the women are so easy to coach. They love to learn. There's none of the bullshit. There's none of the, the pissing and moaning that goes on between the guys and the, it's 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 really been a. I feel so, so uh, lucky to end my career. I'm I'm not done. I mean, uh, you've retired at least six times since I've known you. <laughs> That's actually three, but but it's. Uh, I've got a team now. I mean, we're we've made the Pacific Coast uh, playoffs. And I I start between seven and eight first year players. I mean, they flat friggin' get it on. I mean, we got some real bangers, but we got a lot of smart players too. And one thing I've got with this team I've never had before, and that's speed. I can coach anything but speed. I can't teach you how to run faster. But by God, that's when you point. get them, how do I get that ball to that situation where he's one on one? Well, about 1% of what you said makes sense to me when you're talking about rugby. And hopefully that helped with the question. Kick that microphone to your left a little bit. Keep it in front of, like, the buttons on your shirt. You got it. You can move the whole, like, the arm. You can do the whole. There you go. Look at that. Okay. All right, switching gear. Thoughts about money. What are your thoughts about money? I am graduating from college this May with a degree in engineering, about to start my dream job, and I keep having this sense that I will never have enough money to where I would feel comfortable buying more than the bare necessities. Any advice to all of us young guns out there? Be smart. Be smart with what you do. Always have a reserve. Have something you can fall back on. And then be adventurous with the rest of it. You know, be smart and pay attention. 
because there'll be times, there'll be signs, warning signs when to back off. It's this, this ain't working. Reach out to people that know that have done it. You know, don't try to recreate the wheel, uh, whether it's real estate, whether it's, uh, you know, there's some businesses I'd say stay away from, like restaurants and what have you. The margins and what have you are so the there. Headache. Yeah. Uh, you know, develop an entrepreneur spirit, but reach out to people that have been successful. You know, read their books, get an opportunity to go talk to them. Some of them are just out making bucks off what they're saying. But you'll 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 start to you'll it's like separating salt from pepper. You'll start figuring it out. It's be and be cautious. There's uh but when you see an opportunity, I mean charge. I mean, you know, be be aggressive, but be always be cautious. Have you ever in the course of your life purchased an item that has actually provided for you happiness in the long term? Oh shit, yeah, lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you say long term or short term? Yeah, long term. Oh, long term. Because people, you know, people say uh, money can buy happiness. Money can buy you things. And in, and in speaking in in my life, things can be awesome, but it's not. It can also you can get this addiction to the next thing. Well, I'll be happy if I get this, and I'll be happy if I get that. And now I've landed at the point where money is a mechanism where it can it can't buy you time. But can it, it can afford you the opportunity to make decisions to optimize your time. Yeah, I agree. But it's but, not a thing. It's not like, oh, this thing is like now I'm happy. I think that one of the best things money can buy for you is knowledge. You know? Uh, well, shit, in the modern era, most like, most knowledge is relatively it, it's free. All, it's right there now. It's right. I, yeah. I'm amazed with what you what you can get. But I, I think knowledge gain good, good, sustainable knowledge and experience. Those two things are will take you anywhere you want to go. And as I've got older, I need less. Uh, I mean, happiness, you're not going to find happiness in a dollar bill. You know, it's getting to a point and saying, God, I'm, I'm proud of my family. Uh, I can take care of myself. You know, uh, yeah, just the simple things become more important as you get older. Uh, you always want to, and the hard thing today is, I mean, gosh, the pricing, the price of homes and stuff, vehicles. What was the cost of your first home? Oh, $38,000. <laughs> I mean, shit, I can't even buy a trailer for that now. I mean, it's. What was I, the cost of your first car? Uh, $450, I think. I bought a 49 Ford, no, 49 Chevy, and it was pristine. Then I bought a 57 Chevy. What'd you pay for that? I think $600. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, they weren't the top of the line, but they were good transportation. Uh, you know, uh, the, the most expensive vehicle I ever bought, uh, well, your mom bought a Mercedes, but we got a good deal on that. She Probably was working, your work trucks, like the dump truck. Oh, oh Jesus. I spent 56000 on a dump truck. You know, but th it's that like paper. entry level F one fifty these days. Yeah, yeah. Oh, not even that hardly. I'm ch <laughs> it's overwhelming. I mean, so you know, position yourself. Just keep your friggin' eyes open. Be adventurous, but you know, you, especially if you got a family, you've got to be cautious. Yeah, it's it's a tough world out there. I mean, when I was growing up in the sixties, seventies, you can make mistakes and recover in a heartbeat. Today you don't have that opportunity. You get in a jam, and credit. We didn't have availability of credit. You can get so extended out there. Yeah. People live on credit. I mean, get away, get rid of as many credit cards as you can. You know, it's just, and probably, and just difficult it is, is live within your means. You know, it's so your friends buys. You know, something or. Just the toys young people have today, you know. I, 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 I could never afford any of it at the age that they have. When we moved to Australia, credit cards were just coming into the country, and we lived in a small community town. And they asked us, you know, what, what do you? I, we just told them, stay away from them if you can. I mean, today they're so accepted. I mean, yeah, they they're giving them to you just to, yeah. There's a reason they're so easily accessible. Yeah, yeah. But and I think another thing is, don't be afraid to fail. You know, I don't mean take your whole family or everything down, but if 
Trust your gut, which I always taught you. Don't be afraid to go for it. It doesn't mean you take it too. If it's going to collapse, get out early. But, I mean, don't be afraid to fail either. Especially earlier in your life. you got so much more runway in front of you. Oh, gosh, and you have, yeah. It, you know, if you're a single person versus married with kids, you have that flexibility where you could be a little bit risky. Maybe not, I, you know, maybe don't. Yeah. So don't much, so don't much, gamble, but you could be riskier. So much of it is always relevant, you know, even from our time to now. But it just just doesn't seem like there is the opportunity to recover like there used to be. You know? Yeah, and I'll say it's not about what you make. It's about what you spend. I think it's a lot of times you lost. you got to be people. able to look at the mirror at the end of the day at yourself and have some pride. If you don't have it, I don't care how much money you have. you got nothing. Yeah, you'll be miserable. Yep. What is his greatest accomplishment and his greatest failure? Part two. What did you learn from those two things? My greatest uh, accomplishment? Learning how to live with women. I mean, <clears throat> they are such incredible beings. I mean, and they, they, you know, you can be the most macho guy in the world and one look from them and you crumble. You know? <laughs> you know? It's, uh, and, you know, and, and, and it's, it, I, I, th I think being able to, to I just say women, but learning how to deal with people and making it work. Uh, being somebody that people will come back to you and talk to, talk to you. My biggest disappointment has been my temper. You know, I get real sharp and I, and I make the wrong decision at the wrong time. I think all of those things, if you keep them personal, irregardless of the money aspect or anything, I think is the most important thing. Uh, learning how to think more of someone else than yourself is a huge skill. It's I've been married twice, two absolutely incredible different women, both charming, loving, have been <laughs> lifesavers for me, but different. I mean, it's a whole new game for me, learning different ways, strategies, and I don't mean strategies in a bad way. But I want to eat, eat at the end of the night, you know. <laughs> so, you know, to add a little humor to it. But it's it's all interpersonal stuff. You know, it's 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 like I said, and I keep going back to my women's rugby team. They have taught me patience and humility at a time of my life where I didn't think that was possible. And they've made me a better person. And I think that is probably one of my successes is being able to still be able to do that, still be able to grow and uh, want to be better. I still always want to be better. It's a good place to be. Yeah. Two more questions. What advice would you give a couple in their 60s wanting to move from Arizona, in parentheses, hot, to Minnesota, in parentheses, cold? As far as pushing through fears and doubts about beginning this journey at our age, I've lived in Minnesota about 30 years ago, and my husband has not. We have to get out of this valley due to my lungs, too many people, and the drought. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Stop at Cabela's and buy all the outdoor work <laughs> there there is. Well, and I, I picked this one because yeah. I know that you and Debbie have talked about moving yeah. and trying to figure out, you know. Well, I, I, I admire you. You have the opportunity. My, my better half... She, she, that, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and, and, you know, and Despite I your I, best efforts. efforts. And I respect her grit. You know, I have a dear friend that I, I played rugby with here in Montana, gosh, 40 years ago, almost, I guess, if not a longer. And he moved from here to Minnesota. Uh, I've got a rugby player that's from Minnesota. I mean, you talk to him about uh, the weather. I mean, you... Uh, well, if you've lived there, I'd go back. I wouldn't sell anything where you are right off the top and go there and spend a winter there. In the deep, in deep, the deep, deep dark of the deep, winter. You know, there's beautiful places in uh, in in uh, Minnesota. I've been up on the Boundary rod Waters out of Hibbing, uh, done a couple uh, canoeing trips out of there. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can have Minneapolis. You can, all shades of it, but it's environmentally it's very very harsh if you have 
if you have recreational things that will keep you busy and happy in that environment, whether snowshoeing, uh, uh, running dogs, or what have you, uh, but it'd be real easy to get trapped in that environment. That's what would worry me because I know as I'm getting older, uh, after a lot of injuries from work and play, the cold is really unforgiving. And uh, you might want to find some place in between. Don't yeah. don't just shut your door on every place else. There's a lot of there's a lot of places. I you know I've never lived in the Midwest, but I just look at the weather maps and I'm going, my gosh. But get a lot of a lot of good underwear, a lot of thermal wear. Invest in quality equipment. Yeah, gloves. Gloves yep. are important. <laughs> All right, last one for this round. A funny story while you were in the service that still makes you laugh today. Oh, funny story. Figured it'd be a good to end it on a high note. <laughs> funny story in the military. Oh, gosh. Oh, man. <laughs> it's not like the one with the condoms. I can't think of one like quite like that, but <laughs> what the hell? The funny story. How often do you think back? Oh, well, your- okay. Here it is. Yeah, I uh, I got home from, uh, from overseas, <laughs> and... Uh, I uh, they didn't know what to do with me. I was real short, and they put me on a destroyer, and uh, it was really great because they asked if I had any real. They asked if I had any skills. I was a a gunner's mate, and and I had no idea about what their duties on a destroyer. Gun. So they asked me if I could type, and I said, "Oh, sure." I that class got me through high school. So they gave me an officer stateroom, which was the size of a closet and a typewriter, and they were redoing the bupers, all the rules and regulations of the military. I had no duty watch, no nothing, and I had my own little little bed, little bathroom in there. And so, and we went on a midshipman's cruise where we went from San Diego to San Francisco with a whole flotilla of ships, and we picked the midshipman up from the Naval Academy and went to Hawaii. I'd never been out to sea. Jesus, you know, you get up in the morning and there's no land. I mean, you look around. <laughs> it, holy shit. It was, I had never, I was, <laughs> that was, that was a little overwhelming. And, uh, but I had a, it, it was fun. So I got to know a couple of the guys. One of them, and the, the, the drinking age in, in Honolulu was like 18 years old. How old were you at this point? I was 20. Okay. Yeah. So we got into Pearl Harbor, first night in, and uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, you're just buying pictures by the gallons, you know, and it just, and we'd been there a long time. I mean, there must have been 2,000 people in this place. It was just crazy. Well, after a while, you're going back and forth from the bathroom to use the urinal quite a bit, and I can't, couldn't find my friend. He's a young guy. And I go in, and there he is laying in a urinal. <laughs> and he's got these little mints on him. You know, we're in our dress whites, and these mints are... You're talking about the urinal mints. Yes, they're, they're not breath mints. Yeah. <laughs> but a couple guys tried to use them as a breath. Yeah. And they're they're radiating out on his dress whites. <laughs> I mean, I threw him over my shoulder, carried him back on the ship... And I've never forgot that. I mean, it's, it's. I, I, I can't remember his name to save my life, but we called him Baby. But it was just this mass of humanity. How I even got back to the ship, I don't remember. Changed my blouse. That's what they called the, the upper part of your dress. You they blouse. still call it that. Yeah. I went right back to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's probably not what you're looking forward to. But it's, you know, there were so many things that were... It was the best of times and the worst of times in a lot of ways. You know, having your first Christmas overseas and everybody getting boxes from home and, you know, sharing cookies that have been pulverized. And, you know, my mom used to send me kipper snacks. and if you That's disgusting. Yeah, you know, yeah, but, yeah, but just, I mean, there's so many little highlights like that or, you know... Oh, I don't know. Going through boot camp and having been raised in a male family, 
your drill instructors are standing out there yelling and got at people and guys are next to me are peeing their pants and I'm just kind of chuckling that these guys is shit I got more of this at the breakfast table in the morning just <laughs> but that thing with baby with finding him in that urinal just and those uh, urinal mints all over him I just swear to God that was the funniest goddamn thing that is all the questions for this round closing thoughts from Dick Broom Actual. Oh, that's right. <laughs> My grandchildren said I had a new nickname, and that's what I was called, Dick Broom. But anyway, uh, you know, I think the thing about reading, I love the curiosity of it, and I love quenching my curiosity listening to other people's insights. And uh, Faulkner was another great writer. You know, he was he was superb. Oh, gosh. The guy that wrote The, the Rain Tree was another one. You could look him up, and he's written a lot of different books. Uh, yeah, it's it's just, you know, it, I so often today use the computer because I can go right to a topic that I want, and there's so much available. And then out of a lot of that, I look at the reference material, and then I'll order some books off of that. It's, it's really good. This one I'm reading now about... Uh, about these taggers, uh, it has such been an illumination for me of just how brutal Russia has been on their own people and uh, and what's going on in that theater today. Uh, Putin picked the wrong place. You know, it's kind of scary what's going on there, and we just don't know what this madman's going to do. And it's, But we've, we've gone through these things before, as long as we don't send our own boys and girls over there, you know. Sometimes you got to let them sort your own shit out. Listening to you describe your use of technology is fascinating, given that I've been on the other end trying to teach you how to use that shit. I have to do it by myself because I make a lot of mistakes. You know, it's- you've been here now for four days, and I finally this morning got you to connect to the Wi-Fi well, after showing you how to do that. It's just amazing to me that you have mastered these new devices. To the I, degree that you have. I have to a, a, a very <laughs> – well, it's now, you know, dealing with the rugby team. They're sending me messages, and I, a lot of it I had to – because I'm also hooked up to the school administration. Well, one of my past rugby players is a whiz at this, so she came over and set me up. And I just – I have a wealth of people that I can go to and go help, you know. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah, it is. You're getting better at it. Um that's it. We'll do another round when you come up. I think we got time to grab a quick bite, and then we'll get you off to the airport. All right. Thanks All a right. lot. All right. Bye-bye.